Uh, okay, folks. How are things going? <laughs> so, uh, wrapping up lab one this week. So far, it seems like folks, most folks are figuring out synchronization pretty well. I've seen some really fascinating bugs. I want to talk through a few of those today. Uh, and I also want to, if there's anything, any pending questions that folks have about the synchronization lab, I'm happy to spend as much time as people want to talking through questions today. Um, and then with remaining time, it's about time we start talking about Boyd's lab two, which I'm excited for. I feel like we've been on lab one a long time. Wow. I'm, I'm excited for lab two. Um, but we'll talk about this basically to the extent that is pot with, with whatever time we have remaining after folks ask whatever questions they'd like to ask about lab one. Um, the reason, incidentally, that it's a good idea to start talking about lab two is uh, everyone in the Wednesday lab sections and in the Thursday lab sections have finished their final checkout for lab one, which means you are presently working on the first checkout for lab two. So as soon as you finish the final checkout for lab one, you start working on the first checkout for lab two. So I am assuming that everyone is now in, everyone in those lab sections is now in the lab two mindset. So I want to start talking through the details of that. Um, before I get into that, I wanted to talk through some, some administrative details associated with lab reports. So your first lab report for lab one is going to be due next week. Um, I've been getting a few questions about this that I just want to clarify. So in terms of due dates, if you look at the course website, I have a schedule of due dates page here. You'll notice that all the dates here are week of, and that's because every, per, every person in the class has precisely one week to complete their lab report. So if you are in the Wednesday evening lab section, which means you would have done your final demo on Wednesday evening at 7.30, or, you know, in that time range, your lab report would be due the following Wednesday at 7.30. So your lab report is due right before the start of your next assigned lab section, which means that on Canvas, uh, the due dates and times will be specific to your lab section. And I'll get all that set up probably this weekend. So by Monday, you'll see um, an assignment on Canvas for your particular lab group. Okay, so everybody has the same amount of time to do the lab, the, the, uh, lab reports. The other question that I've been getting is the content and nature of these reports. And I want to just remind you of a few resources. If you go to the policy page on the course website, there's a bunch of stuff here that you should read. Uh, there's one section in particular on laboratory reports. And this describes the content that I'm hoping to find in each report. It's the sort of stuff that you'd probably expect to find in a lab report, an introduction, your design and testing methods, documentation, results, conclusions, and so on. Um, and then for your convenience, some past TAs have expanded upon this to, in a little bit more detail, describe what would be expected in each one of these sections. And the other resource that you may find very useful is I've included a couple of good examples of lab reports from previous semesters. Um, there's two of them here. So if you would like, you can use these as an approximate model for how much detail is appropriate for a report like this. Um, the other question I get about these reports is, is grading. How exactly are these reports graded? I'll just say that lab reports are a weird thing to grade. Um, they're, a, they're a strange combination of objective and subjective. You know, there's objective stuff like the actual content that's there. And then there, there's, there's a subjective nature to it in much the same way that there's a subjective nature to grading an essay. Right, so I am expecting to find certain information in everyone's report. And um, part of what you'll be graded on is whether or not that content is present in the report in in a sufficient amount of detail. So like we'll go through and check or do a cursory glance through each report to make sure, okay, does this report contain the information that it's supposed to contain? But then the other thing you're evaluated on is how well is that information communicated? How well is that technical information communicated? And how thoughtful have you been to the medium of communication? So for depending what you're trying to describe, there are 
media for communicating the information that make more and less sense. So for example, one thing that I often see every year is um, in the you know, design and testing methods when folks are describing their software, it's not uncommon for me to find like a wall of text that describes all these elaborate state transitions. So people are verbally describing a state machine and all the conditions under which various states transition to other states. That's not the appropriate way to communicate that information, right? That kind of information is way better represented in a diagram, a, a, a state diagram that shows all the states and the conditions under which one state goes to another state. There needs to be some text to support that diagram, a few, a few sentences or a paragraph explaining what it's illustrating and pointing out what's important about it. But be thoughtful as you put together these reports of what is the information that I'm trying to communicate and what is the best way for me to communicate that information? Is it words? Is it a diagram? If you find yourself describing a circuit, probably stop doing that and put together a circuit diagram. That's probably the best way to communicate that information. So just be thoughtful of this stuff. And in terms of amount of detail, I, I think you'll find the example reports really useful for getting a sense of that. But to give you a, a, an approximate measure of this, I think it's useful to imagine the audience for this report to be yourself in maybe two years. So you can assume that for the audience of the report is familiar with microcontrollers and familiar with this architecture. Um, but suppose that you've set this stuff aside for a couple of years and the only resource that you have is your lab report and you're asked to recreate your project in about a day using your report as the guide for how you would do that. That's about the detail that you should, level of detail that you should go into. So it's not excruciating detail. You, you don't necessarily need to go down to the register level uh, description of how the SDK functions are operating, but it should certainly be the case that any reader with a background in this stuff would understand what you, what you built, how it all fits together, and the process by which you debugged it. Does that make sense? Are there any questions about that? No strict requirement on length. It's as long as it needs to be to accommodate, you know, all the stuff that's supposed to be there. Um, and the other thing that I'll ask you to include in that report is as an appendix at the end of the report, include a listing of your code. So your source file. You don't have to include all the header files and all the other stuff that you didn't necessarily manipulate or change, but your source file that implements, you know, your interrupt service routines and your threads and all that stuff, include that as an appendix. That might increase the length of the report quite a bit, but we're submitting these things electronically, so who cares? Okay. Any other questions about lab reports? How about questions about synchronization? I saw one awesome bug. If you're the group that had this bug and we figured it out, don't, don't give away the answer. The bug that we were seeing was the, it was an example of one of these bugs where it works and we don't know why. So the bug was you plug in the two speakers, they're chirping away. We're looking at the two waveforms on the scope and the two waveforms walk near one another and they synchronize. Then we unplug the speakers. So no sound is coming out and synchronization still happens. With no sound. Anybody have a guess? Yeah. Be like looking at the states, like if you're only paying attention to the states and you're not listening, like if core zero is listening to the states of core one, you can sync it up that way. So that's a good thought. So that that could be the reason for this. Th this particular group's implementation was correct. They were evaluating whether or not a particular cricket was chirping by looking at microphone information. So they were looking at the, the correct information to decide whether or not a cricket was chirping, but even with no chirps, with no audible chirps, there's a hint. Are we listening to another group's cricket? Using both with that one? That's another cool thought. Um, also, no, but yes, that could also do it. If they were both not hearing one another, but both were synchronizing to an external cricket, we would still see synchronization. Does it, does it help if I let you know that if we unplugged the wire that connects the microphone output to the ADC input, if we unplug that wire at the ADC input, then synchronization disappeared. They no longer heard each other. 
Was there, a, was there a short or like a wrong connection between the ADC, sorry, between the DAC and the microphone and the ADC such that the DAC was feeding directly into the ADC? It was all wired correctly, but you're poking down the right direction here. Yes, by what mechanism? Okay, so if we unplug the microphone at the ADC input, synchronization stops. They don't hear each other. If we unplug the microphone at the microphone pinout, synchronization still happens. So, did you have a thought? Um, I, know, I just want to throw like noise out there. It might be trying to synchronize with noise between like. You're going in the right direction. Yeah. So, so when we a thought uh just a random guess is it like the wires inducting to each other yes so what's happening in this case is when we disconnect suppose we disconnect the uh we, we unplug the speakers right it is still the case that the dac is communicating oscillating voltages out to the audio socket so there are some wires moving across the breadboard with oscillating voltages in them and those wires were physically near the wire that connected the microphone to the ADC input. So they, there was um, electromagnetic interference where those oscillating voltages were setting up a magnetic field which was inducing currents in the adjacent wire. And because we're doing cricket detection based on frequency content and not based on power, so it's not the, the volume of the audio that we hear. Instead, it's the amount of power that we see at a particular frequency. If you, if you, unplug, the, uh, if you unplug the speakers and you scope the input to the ADC, it looked noisy, but you could see the suggestion of a little bit of noise specifically at the chirp frequency. Very low amplitude, but present. So if you do the FFT of that noise, it looks flat but there's a there's extra power a little bit of extra power at the chirp frequency because of this coupling and so you still detect a cricket chirp if you unplug it at the adc input then the you are the uh you get rid of your antenna right essentially what you're doing is you're you're putting an antenna into the adc and that antenna is picking up the chirps that are coming out of the DAC. if you unplug that antenna it doesn't hear it anymore so physics was happening <laughs> Right, which is just a good reminder of in this class, when you're building actual things, it all matters. Like when you are building things in the real world, in contrast to say, you know, debugging something strictly, a, a program that runs strictly on the computer, in the real world, physics is part of your debugging environment. So being thoughtful of how your circuit is actually laid out is important. We're gonna see this particularly in lab three. Uh, lab three, we're going to be controlling DC motors from a um, using a pulse width modulation output. And what we'll discover in lab three is how important electrical isolation is. DC motors, as we're talking about, they kick out an unbelievable amount of noise. If you don't adequately isolate your sensors and your processor from the noisy DC motor, you can at best screw up analog measurements a lot, and at worst, destroy things. So th this point will, I hope, be driven home in lab three as well. In lab three, incidentally, we're getting a little bit of our head ahead of ourselves, but it's balancing an inverted pendulum. And this particular inverted pendulum is hard, hard to balance. The folks that are most successful of this will not only write code thoughtfully, they will design the layout of the physical thing being thoughtful to the physics of what's happening. It's a cool lab for that reason. To, to the extent that this class is supposed to synthesize, you know, the undergraduate curriculum here, boy, does this lab do that. Um, but in any case, that's, that's all stuff that's yet to come. Any other interesting bugs that folks saw? When our code attempts to synchronize, at the moment it does synchronize, it becomes static or nothing, depending on what we change. At the moment synchronization occurs, your chirps either disappear or they become a horrible hiss. Yeah. Have you tracked down the solution yet? Or still working on this? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at lab. Off the top of my head, I, I, don't, I don't know. It suggests some type of error associated with the interaction between the thread and the interrupt. But I don't know what that error would be. Yeah? Is there any chance that your counter variable gets out of range? I mean, we made it greater than or equal to to the text when it That's steps out now. So. <laughs> I also came across that, and yeah. we think it's the locking mechanism. And there's no like safety for it, so it locks the entire thing. You came across a similar error, and you believe that the nature of the error was something associated with the lock. Mm -hmm. um, what do you know precisely what the error was associated with the locks? No, we're trying to. Not yet. Out. Okay, still figuring it out. Yeah. So I'll, I'll mention. For, there's been some a little bit of confusion about why are we using these locks. So uh, maybe I can just clarify that as well. The way that we're implementing this synchronization, the, the way that we're affecting synchronization is your crickets click along as usual. In the event that your FFT detects a chirp that you didn't create, the effect of that is in your FFT thread, you want to modify the amount of time to your next chirp. And you do so according to that algorithm that we discussed last time. But what you're changing is the amount of time to the next chirp. The way that you affect that change is by modifying the particular counting variable in your interrupt service routine that you're using to keep track of when state transitions occur. If that variable has some value and your thread increases its value, then effectively you're reducing the amount of time to the next chirp, right? Because once the interrupt starts going again, it'll be at a higher value. The reason that we have to be cautious about this is if you if you do this naively, it is entirely possible that your thread could be going through and modifying that variable. And while it's doing so, the interrupt fires, it comes in and interrupts the thread that's working with that variable and does its own modification of those, that variable. And you end up with garbage, Some, something bad happens. So what you wanna create is a critical section of code. A critical section being a section of code that cannot be interrupted. No process will interrupt it. The spin locks allow for us to do this. So I talked about the spin locks in a previous lecture as being a mechanism by which one core can prevent another core from accessing a shared resource. If you use the, if many of you have been looking at the spin lock section of the CSDK, and in that section you'll find two flavors of functions. One has names like spin lock and spin unlock. The spin lock and unlock functions will also pause interrupts. They are a mechanism for creating these critical sections of code. So if you grab a spin lock right before you wanna modify that counting variable, do your modification in the thread and then release it, between the grabbing and the releasing of the lock, you can be confident that the, the, the interrupt service routine won't interrupt and try to modify that variable. So perhaps it should stand to reason that these critical sections should be fast. Whatever you're doing, you should try to get it done quickly, much like an interrupt service routine. Um, the other flavor of function that you'll find in that chapter of the SDK guide is spin lock unsafe and spin unlock unsafe. And the, the unsafe postfix is to indicate that that will not pause interrupts. So the, the unsafe spin locks provide a mechanism for core A or core zero to lock out core one or core one to lock out core zero. But by using the unsafe version of these SDK functions, we don't, the, the, each of the interrupts on each of the cores will continue to run. Yeah. And the ProThreads lock mechanism is unsafe in the sense that it does not block interrupts, nor does it block, but it does block other threads. I mean, it only blocks, the, I'm sorry, it blocks the thread that it's in, but not other threads. So if you're, if you're locking one thread against another, you want to use the thread over the lock. If you're locking a thread against an interrupt, you want to use the SDK lock. It's all well documented. It's just, you got to read the documentation to figure out where the appropriate use for each of these things in is. The lowest level SDK spin locks, you can use to lock out opposite cores. You can use to lock out in the interrupt service routines. The proto-thread spin locks are for thread locking. Under the hood, they use a spin lock, but they use it in such a way that it's locking threads. The other thing that I'll remind you of in the direction of spin locks is um, remember that there are 32 
available spin locks, but if you're using the CSDK, I think all the I think spin locks zero to twenty four are consumed by the SDK, and then Proto Threads uses number twenty five. So the ones that are available to you are 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, and 31. There is, I will also mention a, um, there's an SDK function called like spin lock acquire available or something like that, where you just say, I would like one of the available spin locks, please. And it will give you one that's not being used. When you call that function, it returns an int. That int will be a number between zero and 31 that represents the spin lock that you're using. If you use that, then, then you can be confident that you're using one that's not used at the cost of not knowing precisely which one you're using. So if you're trying to optimize in some direction that, allow, that requires that you know precisely which hardware resources you're using, it abstracts that away from you. You can check. If you print out the value that it returns, it'll tell you. Um, but you're not, you're not picking it yourself. You can do the same thing, incidentally, with DMA channels. You can ask for an available DMA channel rather than selecting one, zero through 11. Has anyone taken it outside? <laughs> Not yet? Okay. I hope someone tries because I'm so curious if that works. Um, okay. Any other, is there anything else folks would like to talk about in connection with crickets, FFTs, anything of this variety? I'm very happy to do so. The last thing I'll mention, and, and I suppose that any more, this is really only relevant to the Friday lab section, is one of the things that we discovered in the lab is um, the, the lab write-up asks that you separate each cricket chirp by 260 milliseconds. And that number was chosen because in the recording of the actual cricket that we're simulating, that's what that cricket's separation was. Uh, what we discovered is it makes synchronization a lot easier to detect and confirm if you increase that separation to maybe a second so the chirps are separated by a second um, that's an easy thing to do essentially it amounts to changing one of your pound defines at the top your chirp repeat interval right now that's probably set to 10,400, which is the number of interrupts associated with 260 milliseconds if you were to change that to 40,000, then you'll have a chirp every second and then it's much easier to detect chirps that are asynchronous moving towards being synchronous. Okay, were there any other good bugs? Not that I can, yeah, you got one? Uh, we had the one yesterday where like the, um, the two crickets would like synchronize with each other and then like they would kind of oscillate between like being in sync and desync. Yeah, I still don't know what exactly what was going on there. So, so expected behavior, be because we're not detecting the beginning of a chirp, we do not expect for the two crickets to come into perfect phase alignment. What we expect instead is that the crickets will align to within the length of a chirp, which is to say, uh, cricket B starts chirping before cricket A has stopped chirping. They overlap and they may slide back and forth like this, but because the length of an FFT is the length of time that it takes to gather an FFT is so much shorter than the length of time that a chirp is, what you expect is when they slide apart a little bit, uh, uh, this cricket is then able to detect the beginning of this chirp and they come back like this. So the expectation is that they never slide completely out of alignment. We're seeing yours come into alignment, slide out of alignment, and then come back into alignment. And they, they don't fully desynchronize. They stay within a very close range of one another. But it's certainly the case that one chirp stops and then the other one starts. That one, too. I don't know yet what precisely is going on there. Have you ever thought? Uh, we had a similar issue. And the reason for us was um, we had a noisy uh, microphone. So we were detecting chirps when there weren't any chirps. So, but they were still detecting each other's chirps. So they would slide into alignment and they start detecting some noise and then they start moving a little bit and then they'd slide back into alignment because they hear each other's chirps again. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So we could, we could, we could try to mitigate, if that is a potential problem, we could mitigate that by changing your chirp frequency so that there's less crosstalk in lab, which I think we actually tried. Yeah, I think we still ran into like the same. And it's still happening. The, the other thing that it could suggest is if for some reason it's taking longer than we expect to gather about an FFT, 
to perform an FFT, then perhaps the two crickets would have to slide further apart before this one would be able to detect, before the second one would be able to detect the first one. If for some reason that FFT thread were the rate limiting process in that thread were not the acquisition of the next batch of ADC samples, but were instead something else that was happening, then maybe this could be a symptom of that bug. But we'll, we can take a look at it. Examples of such things might be like, I don't know, crazy long print statements or uh, uh, yields or sleeps or something like this that may have accidentally been left in. I'm not sure if anything's in there, but we'll, we can try to track it down. Okay. Anything else? Okay, then let's talk about voids. Um, and I want to talk about it first by just sort of reminding you what it is that we're going to be doing. Um, here's an animation. So Boyd's, I will just remind you, is it's an artificial life program. Say it's a program that's supposed to simulate a lifelike system. And the particular system that Boyd simulates is blocking creatures. So I'm going to talk through how exactly this algorithm works, but the emergent phenomenon that we'll see is, is this, where we end up with a whole collection of individuals, and all of those individuals will move around in the VGA screen in a way that's really reminiscent of perhaps birds. Maybe some of you look at this and your brain thinks fish. Um, as we'll discover, there's a few knobs that you can turn in this algorithm that affect how the flock behaves. And one of the fun things that we do in this class in some semesters is you build a user interface to allow for you to change those knobs in real time. And one of the interesting things is, you know, with, with the knob settings as they are in this particular animation, this to me looks like birds or fish. And then you turn it a little bit and all of a sudden the behavior kind of looks like bugs. You know, if you if you've gone for a walk around BB Lake and you see like the swarming collections of bugs among uh, above the water or something like that, they sort of get a ball like shape. And they appear to have significantly less alignment than birds or fish they sort of have a, a, a towards the center of mass tendency but they're a little bit more chaotic. Um, and you can turn the knobs and suddenly your brain stops seeing birds or fish and start seeing bugs and then you turn the knobs a little bit more and the whole illusion is lost. Um, and what you're seeing happening here is you will have to create a user interface that allows you to change the boundary conditions. So in the beginning, they were turning around at all of the white edges. And then through a user interface, you can specify the width of some lane through which they're allowed to propagate. And then the system will wrap from top of screen to bottom of screen so that you end up with your whole flock sort of marching from the top of the screen to the bottom and then looping back to the top or the opposite direction. You sort of, you could imagine turning this screen into like a uh, Taurus, right? So they just walk around like this. And the reason that we're doing that is in lab two, in addition to implementing the Boyd's algorithm to just generate these animations, you're going to be implementing an algorithm on the algorithm, which will allow for you to give a subset of your Boyd's, a, a, a subset of a user specified size, five Boyd's, 10 Boyd's, 20 Boyd's, 200 Boyd's, however large you want for it to be. You, you, it will allow for you to give them a bias towards one side of the screen or the other side of the screen. The rest of the voids will remain unbiased. And what we'll be able to observe is, and measure, we can do experiments, experiments with this, is <coughs> how large of a biased subset is required in order to bias the entire collective in one direction or the other direction. This particular algorithm that we're implementing, incidentally, I'll just mention, is described in a paper by Ayn Cousin. Um, effective leadership and decision making in animal groups on the move, in which he studies these systems and studies how, for instance, a large school of fish in which only a very small subset detect the presence of a food source over there, how is it that the whole group of fish ends up at the food source? And it, it's this process, it's, it's a system in which there's a biased minority and an unbiased majority, and the biased minority pulls the whole unbiased majority along with it. So you'll be able to, to, to create a bias subset in one direction or the other direction. In fact, what I'll ask for everyone to implement is the ability to create two biased subsets so that you can create 
one bias group that wants to go this way and another bias group that wants to go this way. And you'll be able to play with things like how many are in each group, what is the strength of their preference in one direction or the other direction. And you'll be able to run all of the experiments that are actually described in that research paper that I just pointed you to. And what you'll find is under some conditions, the, the swarm will split into approximately equal halves. In other conditions, depend, if you have the biases up too high, what you'll see instead is that only the biased members of the group separate from the group and they don't pull anyone along with them. In other conditions, um, one group will pull the whole collective with it and the other biased group will disappear off to the other side of the screen. They get left behind. All processes that happen in natural systems too, and that's what this paper was trying to investigate, is under what conditions do we see groups of, say, fish or bugs or these other swarming creatures, under what conditions do they remain cohesive? Under what conditions do they split? And you'll be able to experiment with all this and, and actually compare to the results from that paper. And then the last thing that I'll ask for the master students in here to do is make those biases, the, the strength of preference that each subset has to go one direction or the other direction, those become dynamic. So if I'm a member of a biased subset and I have a preference to go towards this side of the screen and I look around and I notice that my neighbors are going towards this side of the screen, I increase my bias. I increase the conviction with which I wanna go that way. Alternatively, if I'm biased towards that side of the screen and I look around and I notice that my neighbors are going the other direction or in a different direction, I start to give up. I decrease the conviction with which I want to go in that way. And I start making my movement decisions based more on the movement of my neighbors, which is what all the unbiased members of the collective are doing. When you run this, when you make this small modification where you allow for each biased subset to have dynamic biases, <laughs> What you can then observe and what you will observe in this system is collective consensus. You can set up your, your swarm such that they're all moving in the same direction. You generate one biased subset that wants to go this way, another that wants to go this way. They can have precisely the same amount of members in each subset and precisely the same strength of bias. And if those biases are dynamic, what we'll see is that even though we release this group and they, they should have an equal preference to go one direction or the other direction. Even so, the whole collective will decide upon one or the other direction to go and remain cohesive. You could make them split. If you make their, their biases too strong, they'll still split. But you can set it up such that even though there's dissenting opinions, the whole group agrees on a place to go. This is interesting because this too happens in natural systems. And the, the natural system that we're pretending this is in this lab is a hive of bees and the the process that we're imagining imagining that we're simulating is one where this group is supposed to represent a swarming collection of bees a a, a swarming collection of bees is a a a uh, a colony that does not have a permanent hive location yet they're looking for one so when a bee colony gets too big it will get to an unmanageable number for the hive that it's in and when that happens, the colony will split into two. So a new queen is generated. That queen moves away with about half the workers or so. And for a brief period of time, maybe a couple of days, they come to rest just on some nearby thing, a tree or a parking garage or whatever it may be. You can, if you are lucky, you can occasionally see these. And in fact, if you see a, a swarming colony of bees and you know a beekeeper, it's good manners to call that person because they might come and get the queen and bring the colony back to their little hive so that they can start getting honey from it. You can capture a swarm. Beekeepers do this all the time. Um, beekeepers do this. Sometimes their own swarms run away. So the colony decides to leave the hive and they're in a tree over there and they have to go scamper up the tree and get the queen back and try to bring the whole colony back to the hive. It happens all the time. But if, if you're lucky, you may see a swarming colony. What that colony is doing is most of the workers, almost all of them, are just hanging out conserving energy. They're, they're protecting the queen. They're not really doing much. And in the meantime, a very small subset of the colony is going out and looking for hive locations. They're looking for a permanent place to move. So, you know, if you have 10,000 bees in a colony, 
the fraction of those that are scouts that are going out and doing the dangerous task of looking for a new hive location is really small, which is nice in an evolutionary sense because those bees have a high probability of dying. So you don't want to send a whole bunch of scouts out to new, find a new hive location. They all go out and they, they look around for a hive location. If they find one that they like, they'll come back and they'll do, are folks familiar with the waggle dance? So there is a mechanism by which bees communicate the distance and direction to some resource to other bees in the colony. And the way that they do it is they come and they sit among the other bees and they align, they will do a little wiggle dance for a certain length up and then turn around and come back. And the direction that they are walking, they, how does this work exactly? I can't remember the details. They notice the, it's relative to the orientation of the sun and straight up, I believe. So it's, they're measuring an angle relative to current sun position and gravity. They can detect both these things. That reports the direction to the resource. The length that they walk and wiggle represents the distance to that resource. And then other bees, they know the direction to go and they know how far to go. Incidentally, they measure how far they're going by doing optical flow. They can detect things moving underneath them. So they get a, they dead reckon their way to this resource, which means if you put a bee above a treadmill with stuff moving on the treadmill, you can trick it. Um, by the way, Bruce, do you remember the name of the guy that figured out the waggle dance? Von Frisch. Von Frisch. He thought he had deciphered this. How many hours do you have to stare at bees to figure this out? <laughs> but he thought he had deciphered this and he was looking, I believe the story goes, correct me if I get this wrong. He was looking at a collection of swarming bees. That is to say bees that were deciding on a new place to go. And he was watching them and he was watching the waggle dances. And he said, I know where they're going. So before the bees left, he ran to where he knew they were going to end up and he got there before the bees got there and then the whole swarm came and landed. So you, it is human decodable, um, this waggle dance. But, but in any case, the, the, uh, the scouts go out, they look for a new hive location, each one comes back, does this waggle dance to report the location of its candidate location. The other scouts go out and check out each other's candidate locations and they vote for their favorites by staying at that location for a little bit of extra time. So a particular scout will go to a location and if it looks around and notices there are a bunch of other scouts there, it goes, oh, this is, a lot of people are voting for this. Alternatively, if it goes to a location, looks around and realizes it's alone, it realizes not that many folks are voting for it. What's interesting is it's tempting to think that the colony will only take off and fly to that new site when a consensus is reached. That is to say, when all of the scouts look around and they notice all the other scouts at the location, they say, okay, we agree. We're going to go to this place. That's not what happens. And the, the person that figured out how this actually happens is Tom Seeley, with help from other folks, but he too is a Cornell professor. He works up in neurobiology and behavior. Um, and what he and his students figured out is the colony will take off and fly to the new hive location, not when the scouts have reached consensus, but instead when they've reached quorum. Quorum being a sufficient number of voters voting for that location. So when they look around and say, they will not say, okay, all of us are here. What they're saying to themselves instead is, enough of us are here. Enough of us are here so that if we instigate the whole hive to take off, and then this algorithm takes over, wherein there's biased subsets. Some scouts wanna go this way, some scouts wanna go that way, but our biases are dynamic. We adjust them according to uh, the extent to which our neighbors are listening to us. Then even with dissenting opinions at takeoff, the whole colony goes to the location that had the quorum number of voters voting for it, which is wild, right? If you wanna re read more about this, um, Professor Seeley has a book called Honeybee Democracy, where you can read all about the decision-making processes of honeybees. They are fabulously complex and really, really interesting. So we, that, we are using the Boyd's algorithm to generate flocking. We're imagining in this lab that that flocking is describing bees. And then we're implementing the algorithm that real bees use. It's hard to know if this stuff is a model for behavior or describes the behavior in a more fundamental way. I don't, I don't know, but it certainly models the mechanism by which these bees make decisions about where to go. And then 
we should be able to see this process happen in real time. And then what would be particularly interesting, and I, I, don't, I don't know the extent to which this will be possible or not, is to compare our simulated measurements of when this process succeeds and fails to Professor Seeley's field measurements on actual bees and see how well our simulation aligns with the field research. I think that would be pretty neat. Wait, so when do they call the queen versus like one of the following scouts? So they will, they will follow the, how does this work? They will swarm around the queen, but when, when the whole colony is looking for a new location, the queen will also come up and I believe start obeying this algorithm where she too is deciding where to fly based on what her neighbors are doing. So this is an interesting algorithm because it describes an, it describes an emergent phenomena. I'm going to talk through the details of this algorithm in just a moment, but none of the members of this group, no bee in the hive has global knowledge of what all the other bees in the hive are doing. Of course they don't, right? All that they can see is what a, a what their neighbors are doing. So they can only look out a certain distance and see what the bees right around them are doing. And they make their decisions about how to update their own trajectories, that is to say their own velocities and speeds based on the observed velocities and speeds of their neighbors. And they do so according to basically three rules that I'll describe here. But if all of the members of the group are following those rules, you get an emergent phenomena, which is flocking the whole group starts acting like some sort of macro organism that has its own set of behaviors separate from but entirely dependent on the behaviors of each individual constituent of that group. If you're interested in such things, incidentally, there's research being done here at Cornell that's really devoted to trying to figure out these systems. Kirsten Peterson's an example of one such person that's really focused on swarming behavior. One direction of this is relatively easy to figure out because you can simulate it, which is, you know, you decide on the rules that everybody follows and you figure out the emergent behavior that those rules lead to. Suppose instead you have an emergent behavior that you want. Trying to figure out the set of rules that generates that emergent behavior is maybe infinitely more complicated. <laughs> it's, it's really hard to go the other way, but there's a lot of research in that direction. Professor Peterson, for instance, the she studies a bunch of swarming systems, but one of the systems that she studies is termites. <coughs> African termites in particular have this weird ability to build complicated structures. They build mounds that are this tall, and inside of that mounds are really complicated channels. How are ants doing this? Ant, ants are dumb. There's not that much going on inside of an ant's brain. How is it that this collection of ants can create a structure like this? What what folks have discovered is that the, the mechanism of communication between termites is, um, the word for it is stigmergy. It is communication through the environment. So I'm an ant, I'm carrying some dirt. The rule that I'm following is not these rules. The rules is something along the lines of, if I see dirt here, I put dirt there. And the specific set of rules associated with where dirt is and where dirt goes as a result of where I observe for it to be builds termite mounds. What Professor Peterson likes to do is take those rules and tweak them and say, okay, could we get a system like that's modeled off of this to build pyramids? Could we get it to build buildings instead just by following these rules? Could we deploy an entire collection of very dumb robots that can move a little bit of dirt at a time to say the surface of the moon? and have them obey some similar set of termite rules so that instead of building a termite round out of lunar regolith, they build a runway or a habitat or something like that. Um, so she builds actual robots that try to do this. And then the other kind of fun thing that she's done in the past is model all of this in Minecraft uh, and try to get Minecraft bots to look around and see what the bricks around them look like and then place bricks based on what they see and build elaborate structures in Minecraft. It's a cool test environment. Um, I have rambled almost entirely the way through this. So, so let me just introduce the rules underlying the Boyd's algorithm, and then we'll talk about them in detail next time. Basically, there are three rules that lead to this behavior. The first rule is separation, which let me illustrate this with a, with a picture here. So 
suppose, suppose we are this void, which I'm representing as a bird instead of a bee. There are two relevant ranges to me. One is what I'm going to call the protected range, and the other is the visual range. This is my personal space. I don't want any other voids this close to me. This is as far as I can see. I can only see voids out to this distance. The three rules that I follow are, first of all, separation. If I detect any voids within my protected range, I move away from them. And this maps to nature sort of in the sense that if you have a flock of birds, they don't want to fly into each other. So there's some characteristic distance that describes the separation among members of a swarm. And that is set by this protected range. And by the way, it's different for different species. If you look at a school of schooling fish, they get really close together. If you look at a flock of starlings in the evening over the baseball fields, they're considerably farther apart than the, than the fish are. So there's a characteristic distance that describes each schooling creature. So in any case, the first rule I follow is move away from anybody too close to me. The next rule I follow is I look at all of the voids that I can see that I'm not just trying to get away from, and I look at the direction that they're going, and I gently point myself in the average direction of my neighbors, the average, the average of the direction of travel of my neighbors. And this is because I want to fly with the group. I don't want to fly off in some random direction. I want to align myself with the direction that my neighbors are going. And all of my neighbors, incidentally, are doing the same for me and to the voids that they can see that I can't. Right? So there's a mechanism here for coupling across the flock. I can't see every void in the flock, but I can see voids that can see voids that I can't see. And they're trying to align with, the, align with those voids. And then the last rule that we're following is cohesion which is I look again at all the voids in my visual range. And in addition to trying, align myself, trying to align myself with their direction of travel, I'm also trying to point myself gently towards the center of mass of them. I want, I want to stay with them and stay close to them. And then we're going to add a couple of incidental other rules just to make this illusion a little bit better. There's going to be speed limits. There's going to be a minimum speed that each void can travel. And there's going to be a maximum speed that each void can travel. This is supposed to simulate the fact that birds, for example, generally can't, I mean, unless you're a hummingbird, you generally can't just hover. You're moving with some velocity. It helps the illusion if all the voids are always moving. But we do give them some range of acceptable velocities, which means a trailing void can catch up to leading voids. That really helps with the illusion. And then, of course, we're also going to have them turn around at the barriers. And you'll have a user interface to describe what those barriers look like. They may turn around at all the walls of the VGA screen. They almost may alternatively turn around as we were watching at two walls and then wrap through the other direction. Um, and then, of course, the last rule that you'll implement has to do with these biases, which is I go through and I, I update the direction of travel according to what all my neighbors are doing. And then at the last moment, I also give myself a little bias in addition to all of those updates. And that tends me towards one direction or the other direction. And even if I'm biased, because my neighbors are also following these rules, if I start wandering off this way, I'm going to pull my neighbors along with me to some extent, because they're trying to point in the direction that I'm traveling. I have an influence on that, at least. So do their other neighbors. But I'm influencing that. And they're also trying to tend towards a center of mass to which I am contributing with my position. And if my position starts listing off this way, I'm going to pull that center of mass off this way and drag the group with me. OK, so we'll talk a lot more technically next time. I intended to do that today, but got a little carried away. Um, that's OK. We'll, we'll talk in detail next time about implementation strategies.